Hey, Miss Susie. Uh, it's good to see you. I was wondering if anybody was going to join tonight. I was kind of like just sitting here by myself for a few minutes. So, uh, thanks everybody for uh, logging on tonight. I'm going to take a second or two here just to kind of give folks opportunity to um, log in and join in. So good to see you. Welcome, welcome to my home again. Uh, it's good to have you here. Hey, Miss Becky. Good to see you on tonight. Um, I hope everybody had a good day. Hey, Michael. Good to see you, brother. Um, cold, rainy day. Nice, uh, right? Soggy. A little bit soggy out there. Um, if, if you noticed in the background, uh, I still have a Christmas tree. Our tree are up. Our garland's still up. And that's okay. We still got everything out. Uh, don't know if, if you're a quick packer. Uh, do you still have your Christmas decorations up or are you a quick packer and uh, like as soon as Christmas is over you take them down or the next couple of days after Christmas do you take them down uh, we like to kind of leave ours up a little bit one it's a lot of work getting them up I hate just to, to take them back down uh, so quickly and two uh, it's raining outside and it's cold. I don't want to get outside and take the lights down. And three, I'm lazy sometimes and uh, just have to take a little bit. Uh, not Miss Becky's already, you've taken everything down. Like Christmas is over with. Get it out of here. So, uh, all right. Yeah, some people, you know, they're quick. They pack up real quick. But uh, we leave ours out. We got a new tree this year, so uh, kind of shared that with y'all in the background. You've seen it, so we just kind of like looking at it. And so we turn the lights on still. So, but uh, don't know if anybody else out there still has their stuff up and likes to leave it up. Uh, that's cool too. So, hey, Miss Leslie, good to have you on tonight. Uh, speaking of Miss Leslie, you've reminded me, I also made myself a note, is uh, there will be no WMU this Friday. So uh, I didn't want to. Uh, I remembered Miss Leslie. Um, surprisingly enough, I did post it on fo Facebook. I know not all our folks are on Facebook, but so um, if you would help um, help pass the word about the WMU and uh, not having that, um, we're going to conclude. Let's see tonight. Uh, we're keep on our Genesis study. And then next week, which is January the 6th, we're going to wrap it up uh, with chapter 11 in the Tower of Babel. So uh, you took yours down Christmas Day. Miss Leslie? Wow, that's impressive. Just, just I'm done. It's like, Miss Leslie's like, I'm done with them. I'm like, Psh, they're out of here. So uh, what if what if somebody wanted to bring you a present, Miss Leslie, and put it under a tree? What if they're running late or something? You wouldn't have any tree or stocking to put gifts in. So uh, we're going to uh, finish up uh, next week in Genesis. I hope you've enjoyed the study tonight. We're going to get into it here in just a minute. Uh, this is actually 11. We've been this is 11 weeks. Next week will be week 12 that we've been in Genesis, and we will finish at the Tower of Babel. Um, after that, I am going to start a new study on January the 13th on false religions and cults. Uh, our approach to that is going to be uh, comparing different world religions and cults to Christianity. Uh, we're not going to uh, be making fun of false religions or poking fun of those that uh, are part of those. But what we're going to do is we're going to compare them to Christianity. We're going to go through what they teach, uh, how they differ uh, from Christianity, and hopefully that will stress in us the need to share the gospel more because we're talking, um, we're talking millions and millions of people uh, that are following after uh, false teachings. And uh, we're going to look at their beginnings, how did they start, we're going to look at their founders. We're going to look at the key teachings in each one of them, uh, what they believe about God, what they believe about creation, which is going to be kind of neat since we just kind of finished our creation study. Uh, we're going to be able to see kind of what they teach about creation and think about creation, what they think about sin and teach about sin, uh, salvation, 
uh, Jesus, uh, what, what do they, who do they say he is, uh, teachings, uh, various teachings from their writings. Uh, we're going to look at Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, Jehovah Witness, Mormons, Scientology, and a few others along the way. There are so many out there that uh, it's kind of hard to narrow it down, but uh, we'll look at the, the main ones uh, the ones that you probably will encounter or you even may know some people uh, that uh, uh, follow, uh, you know, fit into one of these religions. Uh, and then uh, we'll also uh, probably a lesson, maybe, possibly two. We'll look at some of the lesser known ones, but we'll be able to cover like a bunch of those uh, in one night. So... Uh, that's kind of the, the direction I'm heading after we finish up here. Next Wednesday night, we'll finish our Genesis study. Uh, if you have your prayer list uh, from Sunday, uh, if you got that handy, uh, I keep mine in my Bible so I can kind of have it at hand. Um, if you look over it, if you do have yours, if you have any updates on anyone, um, if you would just kind of let me know, you can post that in the comment. And I mention this all the time. I have a little, I don't know, I just not real comfortable about putting prayer requests and stuff on, on social media. I don't know why, it's just a thing with me. Um, I kind of like to keep things, uh, you know, I don't know what the difference, like I'm texting, I, I just, I don't know, it's a weird thing about me, I guess. Uh, but if, if you feel the same way, you can text any kind of updates or information. If you have somebody that you want to add to the prayer list, you can text me or, you know, if you want to, you can put it in the comments. You don't have to, Larry, okay, Larry's still the same. All right, thanks. Thanks, Miss Becky. Um, I'll make a note there. Uh, so still the same, so no change since Sunday. Okay, uh, if you have people you want to add um, and or updates, I know we've done updates, so uh, we'll try to get the updated list out Sunday. Um, that way we'll have, we can kind of keep that current. But if there's anything that I'm not aware of, I haven't heard of anything um, from anyone uh, when I don't, I kind of assume everybody's do, doing okay or, or maybe there's no changes on the prayer list. So um, I hope that's the case. I hope everybody's doing well. Um, I know we still got folks sick and everything. Um, we are going to kind of, since Christmas, uh, hey Steve, it's good to have you back, brother. Uh, since Christmas and we've kind of been around folks and everything, we're still going to kind of uh, be on a modified service schedule like we have been uh, our Sunday mornings. We're not going to do Sunday school, at least for the next couple of weeks. And we're going to do Sunday morning only. Uh, and uh, we're still going to sing. We're still going to mask up. We're still practicing our social distancing skills, which uh, we're getting quite proficient in our social distancing skills. Um, so we're going to kind of keep those. We just want to kind of uh, make sure we don't leap back into, because uh, I know my, my kids are from out of town and everything, and, and we hung out all weekend. And so uh, we just want to, you know, be safe and continue to be safe as we uh, dive into next year. When we get together in person Sunday, we will be in 2021. Get 2020 out of here right let's move on and so uh be looking forward to seeing you next year and uh but i just wanted to kind of give you a heads up about that we'll still continue on wednesday night we're going to do a couple more onlines and then we're just going to kind of evaluate from there uh, and and that will kind of let us know about uh, uh wednesday nights we're going back online with our children, with our youth, uh, you know, Sunday school, those kind of things. And uh, I know that, you know, even with, with WMU and our groups and stuff, uh, what we're going to do and kind of how we're going to approach that. So uh, that's where we're at. want to keep you informed. Just keep the word out. So uh, 
If there's not anything or anybody got anything to add to the uh, prayer list, um, you can post that or you can text me uh, during our, our lesson. Uh, that's fine too. That won't bother me at all. If you have something to add, you can let me know. But uh, if we will, this, uh, just kind of look over uh, folks. Um, hey, Miss Mary, it's good to have you with us tonight as well. Miss you, miss seeing you in person, but glad you're so faithful to join us uh, online and to see you checking in there. Um, let's uh, let's just take a, t a little bit of time tonight uh, before we dive into our lesson, and let's just uh, begin our, our praying tonight and just lift up some of these uh, names uh, on our list. Uh, if you have uh, request you can uh, lift those up to the Lord as well during this time and we'll just spend a, a couple of minutes in prayer tonight before we get started um, father we thank you so much for this day uh, father we uh, uh, we kind of joke around about wanting 2020 to be over and want a new start but even in the midst of, of everything uh, the craziness and the chaos and and the insecurities and the fear and and the hurt and the pain god you have you have been faithful and you've been good um, through it all father you have seen us to this point you have not abandoned us you have not forsaken us and father you're not going to and we thank you for that we praise you father we 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 love and adore you for that very fact that you are the one constant in our life when things just seem to sometimes go off the rails and father there's so many needs god there's still people sick with covid lord and we just Pray that you will move in their lives, Father, and touch their bodies. Father, there are those dealing with cancer. There are those that are dealing with other illnesses, Lord, surgeries, aches and pains, uh, lingering things that they've dealt with, Father. There's the dealing with even going to the doctors, not routine anymore, Father. And there's so many people that have, they're, they're, they're dealing with depression and anxiety, Father, even before this, but this is just camp compounded to that, God. And Father, there are people that are struggling financially as well because they've, they've lost their income or maybe they've lost their job or lost their business. And Father, I pray that you will be gracious and merciful, God, and that you will just be with each and every person. That you will watch over them, Father, that you will meet their needs, that you will bless them, that you will touch them, that you will heal them, that you will begin to bring them out of whatever obstacle, Father, that stands before them. And Lord, thank you for watching over our church, God, just being with us, allowing us to, 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 to be together the times that we can be together. Father, we don't take that for granted or take it lightly, God. We, we, we know that it's, it's, it's because of you. And Father, be with us tonight as we open up your word and study your word. God, I pray that you will just speak to us, Father. And that when we read your word and study your word, God, that we will, we will know more things about you. And will give us understanding. Father, most of all, thank you for your son, Jesus, who, who died on a cross for the sins of the world. He took on our punishment and our shame in order that we could be saved. 
and be made right with you. Lord, we love you and we thank you for this opportunity to be together. It is in the precious name of Jesus I pray. Amen. So tonight um, we are, um, let me get my notes up here. We are, ah, this. we're going to be in chapter 8. We left off um, last week, the flood, We or not last week, because last week we had our Christmas Eve. Christmas Eve Eve service. Uh, we left off the week before that. We were, uh, you know, the ark had landed in the, the mountains of Ararat, and um, God had opened the door, and uh, Noah, Miss Noah, Ham, Sham, Japheth, Miss Ham, Miss Sham, Miss Japheth, and the animals that were contained in the ark uh, they were uh, they were they were out, and so uh, we're going to pick up in verse twenty of chapter eight, uh, and we're going to go through chapter ten to verse thirty two. So we're going to cover quite a bit of territory, but we're not going to break it down uh, so much. We're going to kind of uh, chunk it. Um, it's uh, it, there's there's just a lot there, uh, like everything that we've looked at. There's been so much there, and it's kind of hard for me. To try to say, you know, where where are we going to, uh, where are we going to, you know, break it off at? What are we going to focus on? What are we going to look at? But uh, I want to kind of catch us up. Uh, several weeks ago, I kind of gave an outline uh, it, by looking at creation. Uh, you can kind of break it down into segments, like the pre-fall. Uh, what what does the pre-fall look like? Well, real quickly. Uh, no sin, no death, there was no rain, there was perfect genetics in man and animal, there was no diseases or deformities, work was not burdensome, there was no weeds, and there was one language spoken. And so I'm kind of like hoping you'll kind of track some of this stuff and kind of see as things go along and as time goes along how, how those things change. And, and we're going to find out that up until, you know, when we get to next week, uh, we still got one language spoken, and we're going to kind of answer the question, you know, why why are there so many languages in our world? And and it comes down to Genesis uh, as well. Then the pre-fall, you got fall, which is sin, when Adam and Eve disobeyed. And we know that changed everything. And so it brought us into the pre-flood. What did the pre-flood, before the flood, look like? Well, there was death, there was curses. Genetics were breaking down. We saw murder, diseases, the cities expanding outside of Eden, the lifespan of 700 to 900 years, uh, the development of art, science, metalworking, and technology, one language still spoken. And as time went on, continual evil in the hearts and actions of humans, and there was still no rain. Uh, and so we can kind of see the pattern for the pre-flood, which brought the flood as time went on, continual evil was in the hearts and actions of humans. And so we have the flood and we talked about the flood, uh, globally, uh, the flood globally covers the entire earth with water, killing all animal and human life, except Noah, his wife, three sons, their wives and the creatures on the ark. And so now we're in the post flood. What does the post flood look like? Well, the world looks, drastically different when when Noah went into the ark it looked one way and when he and his family got off the ark he was looking at a whole new world uh, he had been drastically altered by the flood um, the world will look drastically different and the global environment changed to more like we know it now today uh, lifespans are getting drastically shorter about 120 years compared to 700 to 900 uh, in the years old in the pre-flood. And uh, also, I tossed in your notes of the Ice Age happened after the flood. And you might think, huh? Well, according to those that teach millions and millions and millions and millions of years ago, uh, the Ice Age was what accounted for, you know, the dinosaurs being gone and extinct and everything. And uh, if you've seen the movies Ice Ages, they were there's a bunch of them, and they were kind of popular. But uh, because I'm not uh, really, really super smart in that area, uh, 
I have to depend upon others, uh, you know, Christian scientists that, that write about these things um, because there's proof of, of, you know, animals, especially mammoths and stuff being buried in these layers and, and geology has, has proven that, that something happened. So I'm just going to read real fast before we kind of get into our text. I don't want to take a whole lot of time on it. Uh, this is from Reginald Daly. Um, it says, The Ice Age uh, automatically follows the universal flood. There could not have been a universal flood without a glacial age following. The deserts were sopping wet for centuries following the flood. There were lakes everywhere. Evaporation kept humidity at 100%. There was rain every day in the North Country. Winds carried moisture-laden clouds, supersaturated to northern Canada, Scotland, Norway, Sweden, where snow poured down every day and every hour from November until April, probably 500 or 1,000 feet thick the first winter. Yeah, you know how I feel about cold weather and snow. That wouldn't work for me at all. 500 or a thousand feet thick the first winter talk about a snow day i don't think so this makes fifty thousand feet of snow which would settle down into approximately five thousand feet of ice the glacial age the tops of these mountains a mile high would be so cold that snow would continue to pile up all spring and early fall as well uh, all winter leaving such a brief chilly july august summer that only a small amount of snow would melt the small amounts melting in July would be many times overbalanced by the prodigious winter snowfall. The effects would be cumulative. The higher the mountain, the colder the temperature, the shorter the summers, and the greater the snowfall. The weight of a mile or two of ice would cause it to flow outward across the Baltic Sea, depositing boulders all over the North German plain as we find them today. Also downward over North America across Lake Erie, leaving moraines, eskers, Drumlins and boulders across Ohio and Missouri as far south as the Missouri River. Uh, and this is another guide uh, on the Ice Age from a Christian viewpoint. Uh, his name is Donald Patton. Uh, he says, Mammoths were, along with mastodons, the largest member of the elephant family. They have become mummified in two manners, both of which suggest cataclysmic and suddenness. In Alaska and Siberia, mammoths have been mummified apparently by the millions, both in ice and in sedimentary strata. Uh, it is as if they had been deposited in watery graves in some area, but encased in ice in other areas, ice which has remained unmelted. Their entombment and refrigeration have been so effective that mammoth carcasses have been thawed to feed sled dogs, both in Alaska and Siberia. In fact, mammoth steaks have been featured on restaurant menus in Fairbanks. I've been to Fairbanks. I didn't have a mammoth steak, but it was still a good trip. Every indication is that the mammoth died suddenly in intense cold and in great numbers. Death came so quickly that the swallowed vegetation and eat yet undigested in their stomachs and in their mouths. So uh, I also had somebody, uh, I cannot remember who it was, and I apologize for that. Uh, they had talked about how you know, when the flood happened, the earth opened up and spewed out water. And most likely, uh, probably every kind of, you know, we look at volcanic activity, all these things. But uh, they talked about how the volcanic activity blew so much ash and stuff into the skies that it kind of uh, filtered the clouds and the sun and everything. And, and that had something to do with it too as well. But anyway, that's just kind of... Uh, that changed the landscape. Uh, I say all that to change the landscape, but also a lot of people uh, that believe in millions and millions and millions of years ago, they, what about the Ice Age? And so you can say, well, you know what? There was an Ice Age, and it happened after the flood because of all the conditions of the water and the changes in the environment. And so there's, there's proof with the dinosaurs and stuff that they, the, the mammoths and everything that they found. So... If uh, you have more questions about that or information on that, you can share that with me. And uh, if you have some questions, I will try to uh, to look it up. Uh, I did not look in my book. I have the four volumes of the answers in Genesis uh, that are just full of all kinds of questions that have to do with creation. And so um, 
I didn't look to see what they have to say about that, but I think there's some stuff in that. So if you're interested in that, would like more information, I could probably find you some stuff. But Answers in Genesis is a great website, and it will give you diagrams, pictures, and all kinds of things that better explain all that. I just kind of gave you the couple little paragraphs, give you something to think about. So, so tonight, um, I'm going to kind of break down these passages. The Noahic Covenant, um, Noah's drunkenness and Canaan's curse, and then the genealogies of Noah's son, um, because those are important because it's where we come from, and so our descendants. And so I kind of have those three categories that we're going to look at. Um, let's go and read... Um, if you have your Bibles, I hope you do have those. If we start at verse 20, um, the subtitle, that one of the last, it says, God's covenant with Noah. It says, Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing Roman, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the intentions of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I ever strike down every living creature as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. That's incredible, incredible news for us. Uh, that, that, that's good news for us right there because of, of God's promise. Um, and God blessed Noah and his sons. Chapter 9, uh, starting there. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply to fill the earth. Uh, that kind of sounds familiar, right? Adam and Eve, uh, kind of right there, uh, re reminding them, some, it's got to start again. Uh, Adam and Eve were charged with that, and uh, they did, and uh, you know, we see what happened to that point, and we're starting over again. Uh, and so the, the, the command from God is, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. The fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every bird of the heavens. Upon everything that creeps on the ground, all the fish of the sea, into your hands they are delivered. Every moving thing that lies shall be food for you. Uh, and by the way, speaking of that, today is National Bacon Day. Uh, speaking of everything being food to you, so I didn't know if you knew that or not, but I kicked the morning off with the bacon sandwich. And so uh, if you haven't, there's still time to celebrate that. Um, everything... Uh, Every bird of the heavens, upon everything that creeps on the ground, all the fish of the sea, into your hands they are delivered. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. And I, as I give you, as I, excuse me, as I gave you the green plants, I give you everything, but you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. Uh, and for your lifeblood, I will require reckoning. From every beast, I will require it. And from man, from his fellow man, I will require reckoning for the life of man. Uh, that's kind of a little interesting passage few verses there, and uh, I'm not going to get into it a whole lot. Uh, there's some, uh, it's actually talking about capital punishment there, and there's some good uh, articles and interesting commentary on on capital punishment, but it talks about uh, how, you know, I, I hunt and uh, I fish, I, I love it, and and uh, it's talking about when you kill stuff, you know, you don't drink. Blood is associated with, with life uh, and the covenant. And uh, he's just like, you know, you, you respect you respect the life, uh, even though you have dominion over it, even though you kill the food. Uh, you, pagans, you know, the whole pagan thing, as, as you see as time goes on, you know, it has to do with blood rituals and drinking blood and those kind of things. So, so there's a reason why he incorporates that in there. Um, and, and it continues on, And whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed, for God made man in his own image. And, and, and those, those verses there are talking about capital punishment. And so um, I didn't dive too much into that, but I do have some commentary on that. I just want to kind of pull that out and make a note because, like I said, I have to kind of, you know, I was trying to pull out some some things I, I really wanted to kind of focus on, and that wasn't one of them. Verse 7, And you be fruitful and multiply, increase greatly on the earth and multiply in it. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you, 
with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the livestock, every beast of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. It is for every beast of the earth. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. Never again shall there be a flood to destroy all the earth. And God said, this is a sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I've set my bow in the cloud and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. And when I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. So let's look at the Noah covenant. Uh, I got A, B, C, D, E, and F. Uh, letter A, it was initiated and dictated by God. The sovereignty of God is clearly seen in this covenant. While some ancient covenants were the result of negotiations, this one was not. God initiated the covenant as an outward expression of his purpose revealed in Genesis 3, 20 through 22. God dictated the terms of the covenant to Noah and there was no discussion. So God just said, this is the covenant. And he began to, to lay that out to Noah. Um, letter B, uh, this covenant was made with Noah in all successive generations. Uh, verse 12 of chapter 9 um, and God said, this is a sign of the covenant that I'll make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. Uh, this covenant will remain in force until the time when the Lord returns to cleanse it by fire. Second uh, Peter 3.10. So this covenant is for Noah and everybody that comes after Noah. This covenant is, is, is still in place and it will remain in force until the Lord returns, and when he returns again, it's not going to be by flood, but he will cleanse it by fire. Uh, this is a universal covenant, uh, verses 9 and 10 of chapter 9. While some covenants involve a small number, this particular covenant includes all flesh, that is, all living creatures, including man and animals. He says, Now behold, I myself do establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the cattle, and every beast of the earth with you, of all that comes out of the ark, every, even every beast of the earth. So it's a universal covenant. Um, the Noahic covenant is an unconditional covenant. That's letter D. Some covenants were contingent upon both parties carrying out certain stipulations. Uh, for an example, was the case of the Mosaic Covenant. If Israel kept the law of God, they would experience the blessings and prosperity of God. If not, they would be expelled from the land. Uh, Deuteronomy 28 kind of covers that. The blessings of the Noahic Covenant were not conditional. God would give regularity of seasons and would not destroy the earth by flood simply because he said so. So really, if you look at it, you know, we kind of put a lot of emphasis on the rainbow, but the fact that we have seasons, the fact that we have a spring, a summer, a fall, and a winter, other places around the world have seasons. They might not be as drastic as us, but hey, here in good old Kentucky, we get the experience, the full, full, fullness of all four seasons in that joyous. But here's the thing. It's a reminder of the Noahic covenant. Right there it is. It's promised that there will be seasons and there will be regular. You know, we, we, we kind of know uh, about the time frame. They might come a week earlier. They might come a week or two later. We might have snow in March, but we can kind of, you know, we, we look forward to that. We kind of know when the flowers, but, but that's part of the covenant. So... <clears throat> While certain commands were given to mankind, uh, verses 1 through 7, they're not viewed as conditions to the covenant, okay? Uh, they're technically not included as part of the covenant. The first seven verses, uh, starting in verse 8, that's kind of considered the covenant. Um, letter E, the covenant was God's promise never again to destroy the earth by flood. 
So now remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. Never again shall the waters become a flood to destroy all the flesh. God will destroy the earth by fire, but only after salvation has been purchased by the Messiah and the elect are removed, even as Noah was protected from the wrath of God. So the promise of the Noahic covenant is that he will not destroy the world by flood again. But when he returns, as promised, uh, you can go, if you want to, flip over to 2 Peter. Um, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10 uh, says this, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved in the earth, and the works that are done on it will be exposed. So God's promise here in the Noahic covenant is that he will not destroy the world by flood. He is going to, the next time he comes, um, it will be destroyed by fire, and his estate, you know, he will come and remove his church. Uh, those that are believers in him, born again, will be taken out, will be removed, will be saved and spared like Noah was protected from the wrath of God. And so uh, we have that promise. Uh, letter F, the sign of the Noah covenant is the rainbow. Every covenant has an accompanying sign. The sign of the Ab Abrahamic covenant is circumcision. The Mosaic Covenant is the observance of the Sabbath day. Now, the rainbow consists of the reflection of the rays of the sun and the particles of moisture in the clouds. The water which destroyed the earth causes the rainbow. And also the rainbow appears at the end of the storm. So this sign assures man that the storm of God's wrath in flood form is over. I uh, also read something that the bow is a weapon of war and the shape of the bow uh, is pointed away. The curve of the bow is pointed away from the earth. So uh, that thought was kind of neat. But here's an interesting fact you might not know. Maybe you do, you probably do. But the most interesting is the fact that the rainbow is not designed so much for man's benefit. We always say, hey, you know, God put a rainbow in the sky as his promise that, you know, for us that he would never destroy the world by flood again. But if you read verses 15 and 16 in the text, God said that the rainbow would cause him to remember his covenant with man. Now, here's not the fact, listen, God doesn't forget. God is omniscient. He never forgets. So it's not like, oh, I need to remind myself that I'm not going to destroy the world by flood again. But it's interesting. I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. Uh, when the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. So it doesn't say, I'm going to give you a rainbow. And when you look at it, you will remember the promise. He said, I will remember the promise. The fact is this, is God involves himself with the affairs of man. God's faithfulness is our guarantee. So the rainbow's there. Listen, the rainbow's a promise. I know and you know, and I'm not going to get into the conversation about the rainbow and how it's been hijacked and how it's been used for, you know, pride and all that. It's, it's, that's sad. Uh, it really is. But, uh, you know, we know what the rainbow is a promise of. Uh, it's God's promise that he will not destroy the earth by flood, okay? So as we move on, we're going to go to the next section, uh, Noah's drunkenness and Canaan's curse. And by the way, I always get excited whenever I see a rainbow because I just think they're still the coolest thing ever. And uh, sometimes you see the double rainbow. That's even, that's like double cool. And so... Uh, I always like seeing that. So um, let's look at, let's just go, we'll continue on reading. So if you go back to chapter 9, verse 18, check my time out here. Uh, the sons of Noah uh, who went forth from the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. 
Ham was the father of Canaan. Uh, that's kind of important. Um, it's in parentheses there. Uh, I'd have to check to see if that's actually in the original text or why it's there, but it's kind of a little footnote. These were uh, these three were the sons of Noah, and from these people of the whole earth were dispersed. Okay, so everybody that we know on this planet uh, came from these three guys. Noah began to be a man of the soil, and he planted a vineyard. He drank of the wine and became drunk and laid uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. Then Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both their shoulders, and walked backwards and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned backwards, and they did not see their father's nakedness. When Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be to his brothers. He also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth and let him dwell in the tents of Shem and let Cana be his servant. And after the flood, Noah lived 350 years. All the days of Noah were 950 years and he died. So let's kind of look at that little progression there. Uh, we find in verse 20 that Noah begins his new life as a man of the soil or viniculture. Uh, he plants a vineyard. He's going to raise, uh, he's going to raise grapes in a vineyard. We read in the next verse that he gets drunk on his own crop and he was naked in his own tent. His son Ham comes in and sees him naked and goes and tells his two brothers. Now, we have just a few, few verses here. And so uh, this is kind of a summary of what's going on. So Ham tells his two brothers, Shem and Japheth, they took a garment, they lay it on their shoulders, and they walk him backwards into their father's tent, and they cover him up. All the time, they keep their faces turned in a direction as not to look at him. They're not taking any chances of looking at him whatsoever. So when Noah wakes up, he figures out what happens, and he pronounces a curse on Ham's son, Cana, and he pronounces blessings on Shem and Japheth. So I want to look a little bit at that because there's... Like everything else, when we have only a few verses, there's, there's a lot of theories and thoughts on Noah's nakedness. Now, I will say this. The text suggests that it was more than just him viewing his father unclothed, okay? Uh, so uh, there are... I read one commentary where they even suggested that even though she wasn't mentioned, uh, Noah and it would have been Ham's dad and mom were in the tent, and they had both had participated in the the wine, and they were both drunk and they were both naked, and that was kind of the no no of Ham, uh, but the text doesn't really, I think that's a stretch. Uh, the text suggests that it was more than him just walking in and saying, oh, dad doesn't have any clothes on. First off, Noah also sinned, okay? He was drunk. But the greater transgression was his nakedness, which actually translates he exposed himself. Um, now, Habakkuk, the prophet Habakkuk, he connects exposing one's nakedness through intoxication with prurient voyeurism, okay? P-R-U-R-I-E-N-T. Uh, I had to look up that word, okay? <laughs> you might know, but here, I had to look it up. It means having or encouraging an excessive interest in sexual matters, okay? And so, so Habakkuk connects nakedness through intoxication with having or encouraging excessive interest in sexual matters. Now his nakedness, even though he was in his own tent, was an act that deprives another of his or her dignity and desire for propriety. Uh, nakedness is associated with shame. Nakedness is publicly demeaning. That is why, you know, I... I 
all the little pictures of Jesus hanging on the cross with like the little white loincloth, that is not accurate. One of the things about crucifixion was it was publicly demeaning. They hung them up there naked. Uh, and that was part of it. It brought shame. It was publicly demeaning. And it is incompatible with living in God's presence. Uh, let me give you a couple of, of reference. Uh, Exodus 20, uh, 26 and Deuteronomy 23, 12 through 14. But Noah is in his own tent. So this makes Ham the invasion of his privacy more contemptible and his guilt more deserving of blame. All right. So the Hebrew phrase to look at, it is not a harmless or accidental seeing, okay? It's not like Ham walked in and was like, oh, look out, and then jumped back out, okay? Pruerent voyeurism is the worst sort, okay? Ham's action is perverse for his homosexual voyeurism. Uh, there are some thoughts and theories that Ham did more than just look upon his father's nakedness. I don't know if the text allows that or not. Um, they 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 claim that you know all the details we do not have that there was more to the story than what the writer actually put down. I, I don't know if that's correct or not. I don't know, but. I do know from the phrase and the words that he dwelt there a long, long time looking at his dad. Uh, I'm not going to go into a lot of that because uh, I think you get the picture. So he dishonors his father, whom he should have revered in, in any case, regardless of whether he was clothed or not clothed, he, he dishonored him. Then he increases the dishonor by pro proclaiming it to his brothers. We don't know what he said. We don't know if he was, you know, like, ah, you know, the old man is drunk and passed out. And he's naked. And he's making fun of him. We, we don't know. Or, or maybe he just went and told him, uh, you know, you're never going to believe what I saw or, or anything. We don't know. You know what he said we just know that he told them and they went and covered him up and they took great great care in making sure that they did not see him uh, so they knew that it was wrong the, the two of them knew that it was wrong and so that's why they took all the precautions to make sure that they covered up their father uh, and not and not look at him. But I'm going to kind of show you a few minutes why they, uh, when we look at the genealogy of Noah's sons, why there was more to just, it wasn't just like an accidental glance. Uh, so the question is this, if Ham sinned by looking upon his father's nakedness, why was his son Cain accursed? Because, you know, it was Ham that did it. So why was his son cursed? Well, the question, that question can be resolved by recognizing the nature of Noah's statements in verse 25 through 27, which 25 through 27 is where he, uh, and he said, cursed be Cana, a servant of servants shall be, uh, he, he be to his brothers. He also said, Blessed be the Lord of the God of Shem. Let Cana be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth and let him dwell in tents of Shem. Let Cana be his servant. Uh, that is called a patriarchal pronouncement. Okay. He was in a patriarch uh, society, a uh, patriarchal pronouncement. These pronouncements concern fertility of the family, they can concern land and territory. And they can concern who will dominate who. You will serve this family, this family, this son will serve this son. Uh, these pronouncements often include negative and positive statements. And they are often given by the father on his deathbed, but it's not limited to that situation. It is not uncommon for the father to make his pronouncement of an offspring rather than the child. 
That's not that uncommon. Uh, we assume that Ham got off without punishment. We don't know that uh, because the writer may not have included that information in the text. Uh, we do know that they were blessed prior to that when they came off the ark after the sacrifices, but we're just automatically assumed with the information we have that Ham got off, and, and that may not be the case at all. Uh, Noah may have pronounced a curse on Ham too, but here's the thing. The author did not feel obligated to record everything, but he wants to focus on the part most pertinent to the story. Uh, remember pretty much everything about creation and everything that we've got up to this point are, are snapshot uh, little summaries, little little glimpses of creation, little glimpses of things that are going on. They're not, you know, we don't, we're not privy to, to all the information. So uh, it, it could be. <clears throat> One commentary suggests that the curse was not necessarily directed at Cana himself, but to the lineage of Cana that follows. And there are reasons for this that I will look at when we get to the genealogies on the three sons, when we get down there and we look at Ham's line. But uh, we're, we're going to look at that just a second. Uh, so so that's kind of where, where we're at on that. Uh, and it wasn't a good thing. It wasn't just, I guess, it wasn't just a merely accidental uh, there, there was more going on there than than we have in the in the text. Um, so we get to chapter ten, and we're going to kind of this is going to kind of where we'll wrap up tonight. It's the genealogies of Noah's son. Uh, I I will not. I'm not going to read all these. Um, I, I I cannot. I tell you what. I I'll, I cannot uh, come across like all these names without thinking about about Brother Frank, uh, man, I, I miss him so much, and uh, <laughs> just the things that he said to me, uh, and, and I remember, you know, years and years ago, uh, he always said this, you know, I can, people come to these names in the Bibles like, I can't pronounce them, and, and you know, he, here he is your seminary professor, and he's like, uh, you know how to pronounce them, and you're like, I can't even read like three fourths of those. There's no way to pronounce them. And he's like, well, you know, I, I can tell you how to pronounce them. And you're thinking, hey, he's going to give me like some great insight to some Hebrew uh, pronunciation and how to understand that. And he says, you pronounce them with confidence. And I was just like, I will never forget that. It's just like, if you don't know how to pronounce them, you just, you read them like you do. And so I'm not going to go through all of them but uh, we we look at them, and, and I want to kind of break down the sons real fast as we go through it. And we find about Japheth. Japheth is the oldest son. Uh, verses 2 through 5, it says, These are the generations of the son of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Uh, sons were born to them after the flood. Uh, we got, uh, it, it, But if you do read the names, you might recognize some city names as well. And there's a reason for that because cities and, and, and the people came from these. So you might remember uh, Gomer, Magog, Gog and Magog. There's Magog, uh, Tubal, uh, Meshach, uh, the sons of Gomer. It also lists the, the, the next line. Uh, it's got the sons of Javan. There's Tarshish uh, there, right? Saul was from there. That's where uh, Jonah was going to go. Uh, so, and it says, in verse 5 says, From these the coastland people spread in their lands, each with his own language by their clans and in their nations. Um, the, <clears throat> these were the Gentiles. This is where we come from. They spread out along the coastlands around the Mediterranean. Uh, Japheth is listed as the father of Gomer which is the nomadic people north of the Black Sea. Magog is Lydia. Madai is northwest Iran. Javan is the Greeks. Tubal is Phrygia or Turkey. Meshach is Phrygia, that same area. And Tyrus is the Aegean Sea region, Italy. 
and so their descendants became the people who lived to the north and west of Israel. And after Babel, spoke what today are classified as Indo-European languages. Uh, at this time, even though this comes before the Tower of Babel, it talks about each with his own language by their clans in their nations. So you could kind of like, we're getting a kind of a summary before the Tower of Babel, because up to this point, everybody spoke one language. Everybody basically looked uh, physically, you know, uh, skin tones and our, our features and everything, everybody kind of, you know, there wasn't a lot of difference and differentiation diversity as far as our, our skin and our, our features go. Uh, but that's Japheth. And so if you're wondering where the Gentiles come from and, and where we came, that's, that's where we came. Uh, Ham is the youngest of Noah's three sons. He had four sons, Cush, which is actually Nubia and northern Sudan, Mizram, which is Hebrew for Egypt, Put is Libya, and Cana. Now, Canaan refers to the southern Levant or the modern-day Israel, Phoenicia, and the whole Palestine west of Jordan. So, uh, Egypt was later called the Land of Ham, the Hamic, Hamitic people are shown in Genesis 10, 6 through 20 as becoming a godless and worldly power. It was the land of Israel that was assigned to Ham's son Canaan, and for centuries it was under the control of the Egyptians. Ham is the father of the Arabians, the Canaanites, and Africans, including the Egyptians. Now, here is the due to Ham's sin against his father that we just looked at. Noah cursed Canaan, saying Canaan would be servant to Shem. This was fulfilled centuries later when the Israelites entered into the land of Canaan and subdued the inhabitants of that land. The reference for that is 1 Kings 9, 20-21. Now, out of Ham's, if you read Ham's line, there's a name that jumps out and kind of gets a few verses, and that name is Nimrod. Uh, that's Ham's grandson. Uh, he gets a few verses they are worth mentioning here. It says, he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Now, the phrase before the Lord does not mean that he was a godly man, but he was a tyrant, he was a hunter, and he should be greatly feared. The before... And before the Lord means in estimation of, in estimation of the Lord. Even in God's estimation, Nimrod is a mighty warrior and tyrant, not actually a compliment uh, per se. Nimrod started his kingdom with four cities, Babel being one of them. From that area, he went into Assyria and he built Nineveh. And from our study in Job, we know how, Neva, uh, how violent and evil the city of uh, Nineveh had gotten. Now, to go back to where we started our section of Canaan and Ham, uh, you know, I, I, I told you that one of the reasons why Canaan was cursed, uh, or maybe his, his line or his lineage was cursed and not Ham, we read about the line of Ham how if if Ham participated in homosexual voyeurism uh, and uh, he had started down that path, Canaan is the ancestor of the Canaanite people who later populated Palestine and who were noted for their horrible habits of sexual perversions. So if you go, if you roll back before the flood, and you have Cain, and you have uh, Seth, right? We looked at Cain's choices and how Cain killed Abel, and then how Cain, you know, had Lamech, and Lamech murdered, and that was like, it, it, it led to this, this, this lineage of evil. And then how Seth kind of followed, not that Seth didn't have some bad apples in the, in the family tree, but for the most part, Seth's lineage was one that followed God. Well, here you kind of see that same trend. You see the decision that Ham made affected 
his son and his grandkids and later on down the line. If you look in ver chapter 10, verse 19, you see one of the areas that they settled in was Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, you know the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. It was wickedly evil. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, the men of Sodom and Gomorrah, the angels came to visit Lot, right? And uh, to tell him that they were going to destroy it because of they were, their evil. Uh, that they were so evil that the men in the city wanted to have sexual relations with, with those men, the angels, and the fact that Lot offered his daughters to them. Uh, one commentary puts it like this. Noah's leaven of exposing himself spreads to Ham's homosexual parent dishonoring voyeurism and will sour fully into Canaan's rampant sexual perversions so that the land will vomit them out. So that kind of goes back to why was Cain and cursed and not Ham. Uh, you know, our choices that we make impact our children and our grandchildren. It, it makes, it, it does. And uh, if we were to continue on doing a study of these this genealogy, you can just about track the, the, the people. But hopefully, I, it, I hope that you'll go back through and we'll get to Shem. And I saved Shem for last and there's a reason why I saved him for last. But uh, hopefully if you read through those and you, you begin to see, uh, you know, uh, the Hivites, the Archites, the Sinites, the Arvidites, the Gemarites, the Canaanites, the Hamathites, the, the Jebusites, the Parasites, you know, he, he, when you begin to read the story of Exodus and the wandering and you begin to see the troubles that Israel had with a lot of these people, it, it, it's them. Uh, and it goes back to the blessings and the curses right there found in, in Genesis chapter 9, that, that uh, patriarchal pronouncement. So Shem is... Uh, Next, and he's the last of the three. We find him in chapter uh, 10, verses 21 through 32. Um, to Shem, also the father of all the children of Eber, the elder brother of Japheth, children were born. Uh, Shem is always mentioned first, although he was the second born. Uh, typically, uh, the, the oldest is listed first, but not in this case. Shem is mentioned first. The Bible often lists people according to prominence rather than age. The key there is in verse 21. It says, Shem was the ancestor of all the sons of Eber. And this is important because the Eber, the word Eber, is the origin of the Hebrew word for Hebrew. The word Shem, his, his, his word Shem, his name means name which implies that Noah expected this son's name to become great, and he was right. The modern words Semitic and Semite are derived from Shem's name. Uh, the Bible records that Shem had five sons, Elam, Asher, Aphrodax, Lud, and Aram. Uh, Shem lived to be 600 years of age. He became the ancestors of the Semitic peoples. Abraham is a descendant of Shem, and Abraham was the first person in the Bible who is referred to as a Hebrew. So that's kind of like, as Paul Harvey says, and now you know the rest of the story. Noah blessed Shem above his brothers, and it was through Shem that the promised seed destined to crush Satan came. Uh, remember, we go back to Genesis 3.15. That's the first prophecy of the Messiah. Well, it's through Shem that the Messiah will, will come. That seed's tracked back to Adam's son, Seth, through Shem and on to Abraham, Judah, and David, leading all the way to Christ, Luke 3, 36. Uh, so where did they settle? Well, Shem's son, Elam, was the father of the Elamites, who later settled east of the Mesopotamia. Shem's son, Asher, whose name is related to the word Assyria, most likely is the father of those who settled in the ancient region of Assyria. 
Uh, our fedax is thought to be, by many scholars, to be a compound form of the Hebrew word for Chaldea, which was the region in southern Mesopotamia. Uh, scholars believe the descendants of Shams son Lud became known as the Lydians of Asia Minor, and Aram is identified by Bible scholars with the area northeast of the Promised Land, known today as Syria. The sons of Aram are listed in Genesis 10, 23, of Aram's son Uz is later referred to in the book of Job. So you have the people groups kind of Japheth, who is the Gentiles, uh, Ham also, they settled down into Africa and that area, and then Shem is the, 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 the father of, I guess you could say that, uh, of the the Hebrew people, so that's where your your Israelites, the Jewish people, come from. So that's kind of takes us uh, to the end of chapter ten. Uh, it finishes up, and these are the clans of the sons of Noah according to their genealogies, in their nations, and from these nations spread abroad on the earth after the flood. So next week we're going to finish up our Genesis study. We're going to look at the Tower of Babel. Uh, and I'm going to show, a, I got a kind of a neat little thing I'm excited about showing about the Tower of Babel. We're going to kind of look, uh, you know, what came out of that, what changes came out of that, and uh, how everything can be tracked back to Genesis. So uh, I hope that you uh, learned something. I hope maybe uh, there were some things you weren't real like sure of that you like, hey, uh, that kind of makes sense now. Or maybe there's something that kind of popped up. I was like, hey, I'd kind of like to study that a little bit more. Uh, so hopefully, uh, you know, genealogies, uh, there's a lot there. Uh, it would be kind of a neat study to take Genesis chapter 10 and kind of track it and follow it uh, to see where these people went and what became of them because, uh, uh, you know, it, it all goes back to here. Sometimes when we read about them later, when we read them about them in First Kings and when we read them about them in Exodus and we read them about them in Samuel or whatever the case may be or wherever we read about them is we might not know the history or the origins of them. And so, back to Genesis. So, you have a great uh, rest of the day, the rest of the evening. Uh, remember, it is National Bacon Day. So it is not too late to uh, fry up a plate full of bacon and celebrate. Uh, of course, tomorrow could be a great day to fry up bacon and celebrate too, as the national day after Bacon Day. Uh, but uh, hope you have a great New Year's. Uh, oh, thank you, Susie. I'm glad it, it is very interesting. Um, I'm kind of uh, just I'm and I'm just scratching the surface. There's so much there. There's so much more depth that we could get into and. And I apologize. I, I try to, you know, it's kind of like how, how do you eat an elephant uh, one bite at a time, right? And uh, that's kind of what, you know, we're trying to like just take off little bites and kind of chew on them a little bit. So uh, I'm looking forward. I, I'm glad that you enjoyed it. I hope everybody else did too. And so uh, have a, a wonderful, wonderful day tomorrow. Uh, if you celebrate New Year's, uh, if you stay up late, I do not, uh, you know, maybe nine o'clock and, or, you know, nine 30, if I'm kind of like, you know, feeling adventurous, uh, oh, you're welcome, Miss Leslie. Thank you for always faithfully jumping in. You kind of got this whole thing started, Miss Leslie, when you asked that question that night. So, so, uh, you, you have a part of, to play in it. So I'm glad, I'm glad that you, you've been enjoying it. And so, uh, if you need anything in the meantime, if there's anybody to add to the prayer list or if you need anything, uh, I will not be in the church office on Friday, but you can get a hold of Dodie. Uh, call her. You can call me. I don't think I don't know if she'll be in. I haven't talked to her, so I don't know if she'll be in the office either, but I know she checks the messages, and I know she goes in, but uh, you can text me if you happen to need anything. Remember to lift each other up, and uh, I will see you uh, Sunday morning. Uh, if you need anything between now and then, please, please let me know. Y'all be blessed and have a good night.